Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. Okay, so the text for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 6, 2023, are Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 5. The alternate first reading is Genesis 32, 22 through 31. Our psalm is 145, 8 through 9, and then 14 through 21. We continue our walk through Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. And now we are in the 14th chapter of Matthew 13 through 21, the feeding of the 5,000, which is the only miracle recounted in all four Gospels. So Can there's, a, there's a fun fact. How about there's the resurrection? A, <clears throat> oh, besides the resurrection, yeah. Actually, Mark doesn't really, well, I guess he does, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> That's the resurrection. Prologue, prologue to, to the resurrection, right? <laughs> so, well, so, I would say, it's, so go ahead. Can, can I note first, uh, for our busy working preachers, um, among a community of high-functioning commuters and the like, um, that this text opens up with Jesus keeping a Sabbath. And, and, I, and I say a Sabbath because I, I want to say a rest, not the Sabbath. Uh, uh, Sabbath is about remembering whose and whose we are and the story that uh, keeps us journeying with God or knowing that God is journeying with us. But rest is not just relaxing and chilling. Um, it's pausing stepping away, even from our community and our chores, our responsibilities, um, pausing to put ourselves before God. And in the repetition of brokenness, your people might not recognize your need to rest. So be intentional. Um, I just, I want us to note that, that Jesus is intentional about stepping away before we also recognize that the people follow him um, and, and then Jesus does what Jesus does, which is to provide for the basic of all human needs for survival. Um, but, but there, uh, the commentator mentions that Matthew is, um, uh, well-written, uh, because it, 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 it echoes, uh, the wilderness, uh, the journey in the wilderness, uh, the Exodus, um, and it foreshadows how, this gospel will end with the Last Supper, with this miraculous scene of the feeding of the five thousand. I think the um, I mean, we talked about how this shows up in all four gospels, and the the synoptic version is is quite different sort of versions, you know, from from John's, and I think especially in Matthew, right, where Jesus is a, very much a teacher in this gospel and the disciples are very much learners and pupils and, and, um, apprentices. And so it's, there's a miraculous feeding here, but there's also a discipleship lesson for, for the 12 where Jesus says, you know, you give them something to eat. I mean, kind of puts the, the responsibility back on them. Uh, and he does nothing that a, there, there's no statement here about, Jesus now suddenly surrounded by a you know a pile of baguettes or something like that. It's <laughs> it's as they go and distribute, the food appears to multiply or not run out. And so it's something that they tangibly participate in as facilitators of this miracle and as people who discover as as they go. It's not even clear that the crowd fully understands what happened. There's no marveling here. It's 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 behind the scenes in a way like the wedding at Cana is behind the scenes for only a couple people seem to be in on it mm -hmm. uh, in John chapter two. And I think that's significant as a, wow. as a lesson for, for the 12. And I think that gets picked up again by the fact there's 12 baskets at the end, right? Each of these, each of these guys mm -hmm. gets to go around with a basket and pick up all the crusts and things and, Right, so they've ex they've experienced something in that. So it's it's a <clears throat> yes. We we delight in the power of Jesus here. We delight in the the care for the for the those in need. But this is also like where the training wheels start to come off a little bit. I think for for the church. 
Yeah. And I think too, the way in which the disciples are still needing and will continue to need that instruction and that unpacking of what of what Jesus ministry means and what the kingdom of heaven is like because they you know their initial comment is really the the expression of the old or not the old but the expression of 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 the world which is it's a deserted place it's a wilderness mm -hmm. so we're not going to find anything here and it's late in the evening so uh, it, we're, we're kind of at the end here, you know, there's no real, uh, what are we going to find in the wilderness? And it's at the end of the day, you know, it's evening. And, and yet that's exactly where Jesus will enter into these, you know, this uh, unexpected or un, you know, you can't even think that this can happen at this hour and in this place. And yet, uh, and yet abundance, um, uh, 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 there's an abundance of food. And, and so there's an element to that as well, that the way, the way in which the disciples are still in that, you know, that place of, of uh, looking, <laughs> looking at the world through the lens of, of what they know about the world. And Jesus is trying to show them, right, that no, this is when you have the lens of the, of the kingdom of heaven, this, this is what unfolds. And so... Um, so that might be something homiletically that that we you could explore, like the you know those deserts or wildernesses, but also you know when is it that we when it's the last hour and 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 we just give up our mm -hmm. um, and when is it that's exactly the time that we put our trust in in Jesus in God. No, there's, a, there's a hermeneutical thread from um, uh, discerning God's capacity or God's wisdom uh, versus what you were saying, Caroline, in terms of they were still thinking in the world's terms and what was not. And uh, if um, from uh, last week you preached uh, Solomon's wisdom, then that idea of discerning the needs from what God can do has not yet, uh, to use your word, Matt, I love, uh, those training wheels haven't quite come off yet for the disciples here. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. and even, yeah, and even verse 17, right? We have nothing here, right. but, and so those, those levels of wilderness, the, you know, the late hour, and there's really nothing here. No, there's everything here we need. Everything. Um, and that's yeah, it's quite, you know, what's possible in the wilderness. So, I mean, pay attention to that theme in terms of what can be done here. You've got the Old Testament feeding echoes, but you've also got an abundance that's going to set up next week's text mm -hmm. uh, in, in later on in, Math, in Matthew 14. But you've also got a crowd that eats to capacity, right? All ate and were filled which is, you know, every day for most Americans, yeah, not all, but yeah. most, right? We're used to, we know you, you know, you're done eating when you're full. Uh, this was a, this was not an everyday occurrence for most people in the world, right? To be able to eat that much until filled. So there's a, there's something breaking out here in terms of, right, new possibilities that um, everybody's, well, they just, they don't, they're not taught it, they experience it which is a form of teaching, of course. I think the other thing that I would want to mention about this text and, and it could be a different direction perhaps, but, and the commentary talks about it, of a, of a looking forward to the Lord's Supper. But it, I think the other th way you can do that is to say, well, how is then when the disciples get to the Lord's Supper, it's a looking back, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, how is it that in that moment of the, of the breaking of the bread, they remember, uh, they remember this moment and they remember the abundance here and that they were a part of that. Mm -hmm. And so there's something really poignant then about the Lord's Supper is not just about, uh, not just about Jesus hosting a meal, that last meal, but also on that last night, then they're going to be charged with that feeding going forward. And so, and I always, I, I gravitate toward preaching 
uh, texts that help us think about the sacraments in a little different way. Mm -hmm. uh, and how is it that our, our casting of the Lord's Supper and what does it mean? How is it shaped then by this text? What hap how do we experience the Lord's Supper differently uh, when we have this text in our in our minds and in our hearts, and that would be another that could be another direction. I think you could go. So, in some ways, it becomes more than a sacrament and a symbol. It yeah. actually becomes a gesture of hospitality. So that what are the words? Every time you break bread and drink yeah. from a cup. Yeah, and and I, I'm pausing on that to say every breakfast, lunch, and dinner, <laughs> every time we're in community in that table, we remember the presence of God. Yeah, and how is it that the table then the table is not just here in this moment, but the table yeah. then the you as disciples, we as disciples are charged with extending that table. Yes, um, and and into the world, and so there's. There's a charge that comes out of the Lord's Supper that it's not just about you getting fed. It's, you know, what how 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 are you participating in that feeding um, for the world? So I think that's important. And I would use Isaiah then in some way, shape, or form, and you know, in a sermon with a sermon on these particular themes. I mean, you've got everyone who thirsts come to the waters, you know. Come by wine. I mean, just lovely language there to, to unpack more of that imagery. That's how I would use Isaiah. That's all I got in Isaiah. That's all you got. Well, you, you know, th this is you know when we think about um, one of one of the exegetical ways of looking at Isaiah is the divided, you know, three two or three volumes, and so we're we're at the end of of this prophetic uh, discourse. And it, it becomes an invitation, which which is that charge uh, that you were talking about. Um, uh, after the uh, exilic storms and the consequences of, fall, of flawed leadership, God redeems, God restores, and God calls forth a community to, de to bear in the world evidence of God's love and hospitality to others in need at the point of at the point of their real need whether that real need is rest or that real need is refreshment um this this text i i, I appreciate this caroline the, the weaving together of this text just fits with mm -hmm. this demonstration of Jesus acts and the call for us uh to to live out that charge in the world. It's a text you might want to flag for, for going forward as well. Um, I think I mentioned later on, there's a passage in Matthew 14. I meant Matthew 15, which is the uh, the Canaanite woman. Mm -hmm. This is a passage you might want to highlight and say, we're coming back to this um, in two weeks. Yeah. When we talk about an outsider or a Gentile who, who um, senses that something is going on here. So verses four and five of Isaiah 55 are, are important. Um, hope that makes sense. I confused yeah. next week's text of Peter walking on water with the whole discipleship training wheels thing. But um, this is, yeah, this is a promise of food to a people who have come back and are trying to rebuild farms and rebuild cities and, um, but the but the prophecy here isn't this is just a meal for you. This is going to be a meal that the nations are attracted to as well. So there and you I go. Love, I love the word you mentioned. Um, I I just it, it's ringing in my head. I'm not going to forget it. I want to make sure our listeners hear it. Um, Matt, when you named uh, uh, a few moments back where you named the fact that in this context, people were not used to being to eat and to eat to fill. You know, which which for us, for so many of us, is the norm. We we eat to overfill, and and that in itself is a miraculous moment. Um, that, as you said, should be highlighted uh, when we get to the fact that this is it's not just for us in our small tribe. It truly is the promise of God uh, to break down the borders and offer this filling to everyone. So so thank you for that. I hope our listeners will hold to that. 
And I would then also bring in Psalm, the Psalm 145. So what you were just saying, Joy, verse 16, you open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. And so that's, I would, I would somehow weave the Psalm into some of the themes that we've already uh, talked about in terms of that you give them their food in due season. And that's just some uh, lovely claims about those promises of God that you could borrow from the Psalms and um, it's from the Psalm. So that's what I would do with the Psalm. I'm just knocking them out here. You are. Yeah. Well, um, well, then I'm, I'm going to push us into um, uh, to Genesis 32, which could seem like it's like, oh my gosh, we're going to change uh, modes here. But I think this recognition that this isn't just our tribe, that this is actually extended to everyone, could very well be a question we ask ourselves in, in Genesis 32. Could the very one you've been wrestling with be the embodiment of God? And, and one way is to discern whether the wrestling results in me, myself, being blessed or in the blessing of others. Because what we have in this Matthew text, uh, the feeding of the 5,000s, is the calling of the disciples to realize they are to be the embodiment of the provision of God. And what we have in this scene, one way to look at this scene uh, for Jacob is the one who is so used to being, finding a way to get blessed himself is now named to be a blessing for others. And, and and so that wrestling with God is uh, how do you know that you're wrestling with God it, it is is at the end are you the recipient of the blessing or are you the provider of the blessing for others? I think he's the recipient. He is the recipient, but the story is going to go on where Israel becomes that very fulfillment of the promise that the descendants of Abraham and Sarah will be the result of the blessing for all the world, which circles back to Matthew 15 that you pointed us to that's coming up in a, another week or so. So this wrestling with God, Jacob is still saying, give me, give me, I'm not going to let you go till I get. And what does he get? He gets exactly what God created humanity to be. Your blessing is to be a blessing for everybody else. Take those training wheels off. One reading. <laughs> yep. It's just, oh, it's just a great passage. So again, people, if you're if you're working with the uh, the the, uh, the semi continuous lectionary readings, have a lot of fun with this one. Yes. Um, and you don't need to add verses, but you certainly need to read all that precedes this in terms of what what Jacob sends ahead uh, for Esau in terms of all of the gifts you know, that come first. So uh, Jacob's a good politician and, <laughs> and, and knows uh, what he's got to do to, to pacify what might be a very angry brother and who turns out to be actually quite a forgiving brother um, yeah. and a welcoming brother. Uh, but when it comes to God, uh, there's no sacrifice or anything. They're going to, they're going to have it out. And that's uh, one of the things I love about one of the things I love about this story, and 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 Jacob will prevail actually in that, um, despite the limp. And so, it's just such a key question or a key passage, I think, for people to understand um, the Old Testament in general. Um, to think about the question of what is faith anyway? What kind of God are we talking about? And what is, um, what does faith in this God look like? It's it's not pure acquiescence, right? It's not pure, um, you know, keeping your head down and doing exactly what you're told uh, when it comes to Jacob, at least, and how his name defines um, relationship with this God. Uh, it's very active and very contentious. God can handle all of our questions, all of our doubts, all of our st stalls, all of our setbacks, all of our confusion, that's a pretty big God. Yep. And can also get wrestled down. So that's fun too. <laughs>
I wonder if I could, I wonder if I could deadlift God. That would, yeah. and if I was in a wrestling match with God. That's probably a different text. <laughs> Speaking of wrestling with God, <laughs> Romans 9 and 10 and 11. Yeah, we should set that up. Uh, yeah. I think that, yeah, you want to say more about that, Matt, because it's really, it's really important now going into these next, these next three weeks of being in 9, 10, and 11 and where we are and uh, where we are in Romans and what's at stake here um, for, for. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a key. Th- these three chapters are a key expression in the entire New Testament that illustrates the early church's gradual discovery that uh, that news about Jesus as the Messiah is not going to be as widely welcomed by uh, by first century Jews as as one might have hoped or expected, which creates a bit of a crisis. In, a, in an upcoming commentary, uh, Mary Hinkle Shore will ha- have a quote that says, the problem in the early church was uh, not enough Jews, too many Gentiles, and like basically, and Jesus hasn't come back yet. So uh, which is true in terms of what we can reconstruct about the first century. And so Paul here goes on what's not a tangent at all. This flows directly out of last week. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And he applies that to his fellow Jewish contemporaries and keeps coming back to a similar statement, right? The the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Um, so Paul has a chance to say, maybe God has changed God's mind. Maybe God has indeed rejected God's people, right? That we call this supersessionism, you know, where Christianity replaces Judaism. Paul has a chance to say that, but he refuses to even grant the first premise of an argument like that. Um, and for good reason, because if God can't be trusted to keep promises, then we're all in, in, in big trouble. So. Right. Um, and that's where Paul's Judaism carries into his Christianity, to use uh, slightly um, inappropriate terms for the time. So to notice that, and Paul, it, you know, the, the the rough part of the lectionary is we get the very first verses, we get a really obscure part from the middle, and then we get near the very end. But what we get this week are, is a, a, t- a taste of Paul's deep, kind of visceral reaction to the question that he is torn up by this, that the rift he sees taking place threatens to discredit the reliability of God. Yeah. And that deserves an answer. And I'm not so sure Paul's answers in nine through 11 have stood the test of time very well, but Paul also recognizes that finally this is a mystery, right? He finally ends in doxology, but don't miss the passion here and what he's talking about. And then notice too, verses four and five, right? He starts off right away, right? To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the law, the worship, the promises. Um, He's talking about himself and he's talking about his kin and again, refuses to grant that God might be a a, a promise breaker of some kind. Yeah. We need to explore that, right? Because the original sin of Christianity is anti-Judaism. I mean, it's it's there from from the very beginning and it's, has done nothing but fester for 2000 years. Um, and, and yes, exactly. And so this is a really, this is a, this can be a really important moment, mm-hmm. homiletical moment for a, a congregation that, that needs to wrestle uh, with its own sin of, of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. And uh, especially when that's on the rise, um, at least in our context of the States and, and so that that question of you know what what's going to happen to the Jews you know um, and and this is one of the things that I, I you know in teaching Bible studies I would get that question so frequently and and I always would land go back to Paul <laughs> and John or Paul John uh, Romans That's nine it. I oh, like but back to Romans 9 to 11, that the reality is when you ask that question, you're basically questioning the, the validity of God's promises. Um, and if if God can't fulfill God's promises or if God is not fulfilling God's promises to God's chosen people, what makes you think you're so special that God is going to come through with uh, on you? And so it- And it, Paul will say that as well later exactly. on. Yeah, yeah. 
And so it, it, I, I would, if you're working through Romans or even if you're not working through Romans and you really sense that in your community or you sense that in what people say and talk about and when it comes to uh, this issue, it, this could be a really important uh, moment in your preaching life to put this out there and say, um, when we, when we talk like that, when we think like that, the very character of God is at stake. You are making a claim about God that yes. you need to acknowledge and, and own up to. And is that really the God in whom you believe?